golden hour. Just like any other business, airlines exist to make money. The second you get through security, the clock starts ticking. They call the hour after you're clear, golden hour, and that's when you feel the most self-indulgent. All of those display boards with flight listings are really meant to assure you that you have plenty of time to grab a few drinks and snacks before heading to your gate. In general, people spend about $7 an hour at airports, so the faster they can get you through checkout and through security, the better. Shops. Now that you have some time to wander the shops, have you noticed how so many of them feature twists and turns? Duty-free shops with this design see 60% more sales than those with a standard layout. Carpeted floors, spas, and comfy chairs all help us to feel more relaxed when we are waiting for our flights, and happy customers tend to spend more money. Customers who aren't stressed out spend about 70% more on retail and 10% more on duty-free items compared to frazzled customers. Oxygen masks. It might make you feel comforted to know that oxygen masks are available on your flight, but it's less reassuring that they only have about 15 minutes of oxygen in them. This should hopefully give your pilot enough time to get the plane to an elevation where you can breathe on your own. We know you want to ration your oxygen, but it's important that you put your mask on quickly. You only have a few moments before your brain gets affected by the lack of oxygen. Flight attendants. Everyone hates flight delays, and your flight attendant is no exception. Until everyone is seated and the plane door is closed, those smiling flight attendants aren't getting paid. Helping you stow your bag or find your seat is something that they technically aren't getting paid to do. Not only does a delayed flight mess up their own travel plans, but it puts a dent in their earnings as well. Danger. You might feel the most uneasy when you're high up in the sky, but the most dangerous times to be on a plane are during takeoff and landing. The plane lights are dimmed to prepare your eyes for darkness in case there is an issue and you have to find your way out with no power. You want to have your tray tables and bags tucked away just in case you need to evacuate quickly so you don't trip over them in your haste to get off the plane. Profit. With rising ticket prices, you might think that airlines are raking in massive amounts of profit, but that's not the case. On average, airlines make about $8.27 in profit if you walk through the airport and board a plane, giving them an average profit margin of about 4%. Of course, that number is just an average. Airlines in North America earn about double that figure, where airlines based out of other areas aren't nearly that profitable. When you adjust for inflation and consider the cost of fuel, maintenance, and staff, ticket prices are actually lower now than they have been historically. Rebooking. If your flight gets canceled or delayed, there is a way for you to avoid the long lines at the ticket counter. Just use your cell phone to call the airline's customer service number. Phone agents have the same ability to rebook you that the desk does, and seconds matter when it comes to getting onto a new flight. And don't bother telling the agent the whole story about what happened. They just need to know your identifying and flight information, and they'll take care of the rest. Runway numbers. Airports are chock full of signs, but it turns out that the runway is also conveying a lot of information. Maybe you've noticed a pair of numbers on the runway and wondered what they mean. Those numbers are based on the magnetic azimuth, or compass bearing. Each runway number is a rounded compass bearing to the nearest 10th degree. The number at the other end of the runway is different by 180 degrees, so it's 18 higher or lower. Water. We've told you before that the water on flights is so gross, even the flight attendants won't touch it. But if you're not allowed to bring water through security, and you can't drink plain water, that leaves you with having to spend big bucks for hydration at the airport. The solution to this is surprisingly simple. Just bring an empty water bottle. Once you're through security, you can fill it up at one of the many water fountains in the airport and carry it right on the plane with you. Flight search. We know that flying is expensive and you want to get the best deal possible on your tickets. You've probably heard that you want to clear your browser's cookies or insidious airports will realize that you're trying to travel and jack up the prices. Although some people do claim this, there really isn't any hard evidence. Flight prices change day to day, sure, but booking 54 days before your domestic flight is the really best way to make sure you get a good rate. Ending up at a car repair shop is always a blow to your day and your wallet. Sure, mechanics do have to make a living, but some of them capitalize on the fact that you don't know your own car very well. We'll tell you some secrets that your mechanic would rather keep quiet. If your YouTube dashboard isn't showing enough videos from the hub, you can fix that yourself by hitting the subscribe button and then turning on your notifications. Oil change. An oil change is a quick and fairly inexpensive procedure that is part of basic car maintenance, but how often do you really need one? Mechanics will assure you that you need one every 3,000 miles or so, but that's only true for older vehicles, say more than seven or eight years old. In reality, most cars can go between 7,500 and 10,000 miles before needing an oil change. Flushes. Just like how cleanses for human bodies are gimmicks, so are most cleanses designed for cars. An engine can need a flush if it's been neglected, and there is sludge you see when you open the oil cap. 
The same goes for fuel injection cleaning. Unless your check engine light is on and you're experiencing problems driving, this absolutely doesn't need to be a part of your regularly scheduled maintenance. High-end products. There are all sorts of oil additives that some mechanics will try to convince you to upgrade to. They promise to do everything from reduce friction to improve fuel economy, but in reality, they're little more than expensive snake oil. There are also a lot of products that promise to help you save money on gas, but not only do they not work, some actually hurt the performance of your vehicle. Tires. Buying new tires is an expensive but necessary investment at times. We generally assume that new means new, but that's not always the case. Your mechanic might try to give you an old pair of tires, but there is an easy way to tell if that's the case. Check the born on date of the tires near the edge of the rim to see a serial number starting with the letters DOT. Tires made after the year 2000 will have four numbers corresponding to the two digit week and two digit year. If your mechanic is trying to sell you tires over two years old, you should definitely request a fresher set. Charging double. Don't be afraid to ask how long certain tasks should take. A common way to earn some extra money is by charging you double labor for things. A mechanic will offer to change your timing belt and your water pump and charge you an inflated labor cost. To change your water pump, you have to remove the timing belt anyway, so sneaky mechanics will charge for this twice as two separate repairs. Lifetime Muffler If your mechanic claims to offer a muffler with a lifetime warranty, you should definitely be suspicious. Mufflers don't last forever, so they'll earn their money back by charging you large sums of money to repair the accompanying pipes. In the fine print, it's clear that the warranty only extends to the muffler itself, but most people don't take the time to read that. Old parts. It might sound strange, but a great way to make sure you're not being taken advantage of is to ask for your old parts back after service. Some mechanics are dishonest, and they'll charge you for parts that they didn't actually replace. Letting one know that you'll be taking the parts home with you will ensure that they'll only replace things that actually need replacing. Everyday maintenance. Sure, car repairs can get pricey fast, but most mechanics earn their living on routine maintenance and repairs. They won't tell you that the vast majority of these things are pretty simple, and they can be done with some basic tools and a helpful YouTube tutorial or two. Doing these tasks yourself will save you hundreds, and that's income that mechanics don't want to miss out on. Certified. Some repair places or car dealerships will brag that their technicians are certified, but certified by who? We aren't saying that being a mechanic isn't hard work that requires skills, absolutely it is, but there are different qualifications that you can earn. Having a certificate from the Automotive Service of Excellence just means that a mechanic has passed a written exam. The certificate is trying to earn your business by making the bearers seem more qualified. Second Opinion Shopping around is always a good idea when it comes to car repair, and mechanics are eager to earn your business. There is one secret that you can keep from your mechanic. Don't tell them you already have a quote from somewhere else. They'll know that all they have to do is beat the first quote by just a little bit to get the job, so keep that to yourself. Do you know how to do basic car maintenance? Or do you hire someone to do your oil change? Whether you're a do-it-yourself expert or not, hopefully you learned something that will help save you some cash the next time you bring your car to the shop. Thanks for watching our video, and we'll see you next time. Whether you consider hotels an integral part of your overnight vacation, or just a place to rest your head at night, there are many things going on behind the scenes that you're unaware of. You might see housekeepers pretty infrequently and think of them as the people who bring you extra towels and make your bed, but they're privy to all sorts of things that you have no idea about. We'll share some secrets that housekeepers know better than to share with their guests, and they might make you think twice before laying on that hotel comforter. We hope you enjoy your stay with us here at The Hub. Before we show you to your room, be sure to press that subscribe button and enable notifications to make sure you get the most out of your stay. They touch your stuff. Obviously, one of the basic rules of housekeeping is to avoid touching the guest things. However, that's actually easier said than done. See, most people tend to leave their stuff all over the place, and this gets in the way of housekeepers doing their jobs. So yes, if you leave your stuff on the bed that needs to get made, they'll have to move it. Ditto if your stuff is all over a floor that sorely needs to be vacuumed. However, once that seal is broken, some housekeepers admit to actually trying on clothes that guests brought with them. So if your sweater seems to be a little bit stretched out when you get back to your room, that could be why. Some also confess that they've snuck a peek through a guest's luggage, if it looks like they might have something interesting. And they may give your toilet a quick scrub, but they're also not afraid to use it as well. Especially when things are busy, sometimes it takes too long to run to the employee bathroom, and why should they, when there's a perfectly good toilet right there? If anything, warming the seat up for you could be considered a complimentary amenity, and going above and beyond in terms of customer service. Coffee Maker 
few things are better than starting off your day with a fresh cup of coffee. Of course, that coffee tastes even better when it's free and made fresh from that pot in your hotel room. Well, not so fast, because do you have any clue when the last time that coffee pot was cleaned was? Yeah, your housekeeper probably doesn't either. Some housekeepers have admitted to using the same pledge-infused rags they use for dusting to wipe down your coffee pot. So if your morning cup of coffee has a slight lemony hint, that may just be why. When 28 hotel coffee pots were swabbed, over 4 million colonies of harmful bacteria and mold were found lurking in the pot, on the spout, and in the coffee pod compartment. Coffee makers are a warm, moist environment, which makes them perfect for brewing a cup of coffee or cultivating mold and bacteria. If a housekeeper notices that a coffee pot hasn't been used, she'll generally thank her lucky stars that there's one less thing to do and move on. However, there can be internal standing water inside the pot, meaning that it should be run every couple of days with a cleaning solution just to be safe. Unexpected Sources There are a few hidden spots that you might not know about that can potentially be dangerous. Instead of tossing your stuff on the floor, you might opt to set your suitcase on the luggage rack like a civilized human being. However, if the luggage rack is made of wood, you might want to avoid it. Bed bugs are a huge problem in many hotels, and since they're evolving to resist poisons as fast as we develop new methods to get rid of them, they're especially difficult to exterminate. If you spot a wooden luggage rack, set your luggage on the non-porous bathroom floor instead, provided that it looks relatively clean, of course. Unlike the carpet, bed, and luggage rack, the bathroom floor is likely clean pretty often, so it's a safe place that will make sure you don't get bed bugs to bring home with you. Another surprising source of germs is the TV remote. It makes sense if you think about it, since it's something that everybody touches, but nobody actually cleans. There's also the possibility that a careless housekeeper moved it back into place right after they touched something unpleasant. They're laughing at you. As long as you smile and act polite towards the housekeepers, they'll do the same to you. Heck, in the interest of keeping their jobs, they'll smile and be kind even if you're rude. However, there are a few things that hotel guests are known to do that give hotel staff a chuckle. Microwaves and safes don't have much in common, and most hotel rooms contain both. However, many housekeepers can tell you that more than one hotel guest has confused the two and angrily demanded to know why their microwave wasn't heating their food. If the housekeeper is a pro, they'll keep a straight face and then laugh at you later with their fellow employees. Another source of employee mirth is the do not disturb sign. Look, if you don't want clean towels, they're not going to force you to take some. But you can't have it both ways. If you put that sign up, housekeeping will skip your room. That seems pretty simple, but many guests are shocked that housekeepers don't magically know that they still want their rooms cleaned even though their actions demonstrate they want the opposite. They're not always there. It seems like housekeeping is always there when you need them, so most people don't realize that most hotels don't keep a cleaning person on staff 24-7. That's right, housekeepers stick around until the last room is clean, and then they generally take off. Sure, there's a front desk attendant who can grab you towels or supplies if you really need them, but you'll want to schedule your messes for during housekeeping hours. Front desk staff generally aren't trained or well-versed in cleaning as housekeepers. They also have to juggle answering the phones and checking in guests, so they're not going to be as prompt to fulfill your request because they simply don't have the time. Not to mention that many housekeepers leave as soon as their last room is taken care of, and management encourages them to be speedy by giving them a limited amount of time per room. If you know you're going to need extras, be sure to ask housekeeping for them in the morning or early afternoon while you can be sure they're still around. Take the soap. If you've ever waffled with the decision about whether or not to take home your unused soaps and shampoos from your recent hotel stay, go ahead and grab them guilt-free. Now, we certainly don't advocate stealing things like the iron or luggage racks because hotels can and will bill you for those if they go missing. We're talking about things that hotels actually want you to steal. These include toiletries, pens, and those handy little notepads you'll find by the phone. In fact, hotel staff have a saying that goes, if you want something stolen, put your logo on it. They hope that the next time you write a note on your purloin notepad or suds up with their soap, you'll remember the wonderful time you had at their establishment. You might feel sneaky squirreling away extra soaps, but you're really just buying into their marketing strategy. Looking for more stuff to take home with you? Hotels generally keep a supply of trial size items, such as shaving cream, razors, and toothbrushes on hand, absolutely free. All you have to do is ask a housekeeper or the front desk staff. Most people don't do this because they aren't aware they have the option. Avoid fees. 
Hotel stays can get pricey, and paying money when you don't even get to stay in the room you book is the worst. Most hotels charge cancellation fees if you need to change your booking last minute. However, there is a way around this if you're clever. Keep in mind, this only works if you booked your stay directly through the hotel and not via a third-party website. Call up the hotel and politely ask if it's possible to change your reservation instead of canceling it. Likely, the hotel will be able to accommodate your request and push it back without you incurring a fee. See, most fees kick in if you're canceling 24 to 48 hours before your stay. So if you're going to move your reservation out of that time frame, then the next time you call, ask to cancel. And it's likely that it can be waived without a fee because of the new cancellation date. Now, obviously this depends on the hotel and the flexibility of the front desk staff, so it doesn't hurt to be as polite as humanly possible. This is especially helpful if it's a hotel that you do stay in a lot, as your file will let them know that you've been a good customer in the past. Shortcuts. Very few of us can honestly say we never take any shortcuts during our workday. Don't forget that housekeeping staff are human beings and want to get their job done and clock out. When it's a busy day and management is breathing down your neck and guests are clamoring for an early check-in, you can believe that a lot of corners are getting cut when it comes to cleaning. The bathroom is one place that's easy to simply pretend to clean. Housekeepers have been known to just run the shower and rinse down the tub instead of actually scrubbing it out. Ditto with just turning on the tap in the sink. If it's not done too often and the bathroom was in decent shape to begin with, it's unlikely that any guest will actually notice. While some guests really do dirty up the carpets, many don't, and some housekeepers even just make a few vacuum tracks on the rug to make it look like they meticulously vacuumed every inch. Oh, and cleaning and replacing those drinking glasses is a chore, so they might just get a quick polish with whatever rag is handy. Snooping. The staff at your local hotel probably aren't above snooping, but it may not be as bad as you're thinking. When you book a room, the front desk gets all of your personal information, making it a cinch to look you up on social media. Sure, they may just snicker at your vacation snaps, but they can also use it to get valuable information. Higher quality hotels will use this info to enhance your stay, if it seems that you have a preference for certain things. If your Facebook claims that you're a baker, don't be surprised to see fresh cookies available in the lobby when you check into a nicer hotel. Those files they keep about you contain more information than you're aware of, as the front desk staff will often take copious notes about you in your stay. If you're a good guest, you have nothing to fear. But if you're a bad guest, well, you could just find yourself blacklisted. And not just from this hotel. Hotels generally share information with one another, meaning that if you upset one hotel, another one down the street may be reluctant to open its doors to you as well. The blankets are filthy. The good news is that unless you're staying at an extremely low-end and unscrupulous hotel, the sheets and pillowcase are changed after every guest. The bad news is that is not the case for the comforter. Before you plop down on top of the soft, fluffy top blanket, you should know that those rarely, if ever, get washed. Comforters are expensive, so keeping tons of extras just isn't practical. They're also bulky and take a long time to wash and dry, so any time one is in the wash is time that room can't be rented out, meaning the hotel is losing money. Unless there is a visible stain, there is no way housekeepers are going to spend time removing, washing, and replacing the comforter. Not only do the clean sheets protect you from making contact with the comforter, but from the pillows as well. That's right, you probably shouldn't peek under your pillowcase if you want to be able to sleep. Gross, stained pillows are frequently dressed up with nice pillowcases and kept in use. Not only are pillows expensive to replace, but frankly, most guests don't ever take the pillowcases off, so it's easy to keep them looking fresh, no matter how gross they truly are. The next time you head to a hotel, avoid the comforter and splurge on a cup of Starbucks in the morning. Keeping tons of rooms clean and in pristine condition is a huge challenge, not to mention physically draining, so cut your housekeeper some slack your next day. So you want to be part of the movie business? Well, The Hub can't make you a Hollywood power broker in 10 minutes, but we can show you the 10 secrets movie theaters don't want you to know. Movies cost millions and make billions, and even though your local cinema has sticky floors and soggy popcorn, they know how to keep you in their seats. Whether by attacking your senses or sending you hidden messages, these cinemas play on your emotions to get inside your wallet. So let's be like TMZ and get that rumor mill a turning. Sometimes movie theaters will give you a good deal with their rewards cards, but an even sweeter deal can be had by clicking our red subscribe button. Free and unlimited mini movies from the hub await you. Popcorn. When entering the theater, the wafting smell of popcorn calls to you like a dream. So you wander over to the snack section in a daze, and the employee behind the counter upsells you on getting a medium, or even a large, for just a few dollars more. You've already spent more than you expected, 
but you're convinced to go for the biggest bucket. But why was it so easy to splurge on the larger option? It's more than just their sales skills. Most theaters add coconut oil or canola oil to give days old kernels that new popcorn smell. Not only that, at the end of a given day, uneaten popcorn is placed in unattractive plastic bags and stored away for tomorrow. The big popcorn maker behind the counter doesn't get to pop as much popcorn as it seems, and on average, it's not cleaned too often either. While you can't control whether you get stale popcorn or not, you can manage how you butter it. If you want to distribute the butter throughout the bag, try this hack. Just place a straw into the middle of the popcorn and pump butter into the bottom of the bag. That way, you can at least make the old and new kernels taste just as buttery. Speaker System When you go see a movie like Transformers, you want to hear the explosions and mayhem around you. Outside of interactive 3D visuals and all-encompassing IMAX screens, the surround sound works wonders to make you feel as if you're in the middle of the action. Yet, without many regulations controlling the decibel levels of sound systems, you could face the same type of hearing loss as a soldier in a war zone. The National Association of Theater Owners argue that their films feature certain sounds that jump out at you, but most of the flicks will fall within the healthy range of 85 decibels or lower. That didn't stop the recent remake of The Magnificent Seven from featuring a steady spray of gunfire sound effects hitting 97.2 decibels. Storks from attacking kids' eardrums at 99.3 decibels, and Deep Water Horizons from sustaining over 100 decibels of sound for minutes. The American Hearing Research Foundations confirmed that movie theaters are a source of premature hearing reduction. We say if you can handle going to a loud and proud Michael Bay Film Festival without earplugs, then you're perfect for a job as an air traffic controller or a roadie in a rock band. A loud future is for you. Best Seat You've waited in line for that midnight showing, bought your popcorn, and at 1130, the doors swing open and the rush for seats begins. But which perch makes for the best viewing experience? If the director of global technology at the THX Sound Company has anything to say about it, it's a central seat about two-thirds away from the screen. There, you'll have the best view of the action of the film. It doesn't fully cover your field of vision, but it definitely captures your attention. More importantly, you'll be in the perfect spot for the sound waves to hit your ears. When sound technicians are calibrating the speakers in a theater, they measure out the optimal volumes for each device and then average out those measurements. That being said, sound technology has evolved so much over the past several decades that any seat in the house will give you a decent hearing experience. Through the use of lasers, engineers eventually place the speakers throughout the theater in perfect distribution. But if the sound of those crashing cars are coming at you too fast and too furious, then sitting towards the back and by the walls will be the ideal corner for you. Snack Price For the love of Bruce Almighty, why is it so expensive to buy food from the theater? Back in the golden age of Hollywood, the studios owned the theaters. They could control which movies were shown on their screens and how often the screenings occurred. Flash forward to 1948, when a Supreme Court ruling declared that studios and theaters needed to split the profits of the movies. As theaters became independent of the studio overlords, their profits seemed to shrink. On average, movie theaters make around 20 to 30 percent of their money from ticket sales alone, meaning they need to ratchet up their snack prices to make back the difference, which explains the $50 price tag for a couple of raisinettes of popcorn and three large sodas. Okay, so we're exaggerating. Slightly, but theaters need to set their food prices to high to survive in an era where competition is fierce and audiences oftentimes stay home to watch Netflix. That's why many theaters are willing to partner with companies like MoviePass, which offer crazy deals on ticket prices. They're not making much money off the ticket sales anyways. That said, the theaters aren't a charity case and avoid shelling out the big bucks on food combo deals. You're usually only saving a couple of cents to buy a popcorn, a hot dog, and a soda. Movie Trailers Sometimes trailers are the best part of going to the movie, especially if the main event is a real dud. Depending on how they're edited, previews are the biggest advertisement a studio could ask for. The audience is forced to sit through them as they wait for the movie to start, and it's not like they can change the channel. So you'd think theater owners would be pleased by the 15 to 20 minute chunk of trailers preceding movies nowadays, right? Wrong. According to Hollywood Reporter, Theater owners are begging studios to decrease the average runtime of previews two and a half to two minutes. 
they believe that trailers in their current standard form detract from the movie because they take too long to get to the point and give away too much of the upcoming movie's plot. Even if you're running late to that screening, you still have about a half hour grace period between the start time listed on Fandango and the moment the opening credits start to roll. The time spent running trailers gives theaters more time to sell candy, but the extra long pre-show sizzle reels could hurt their business in the long run. Free Stuff If you're a regular visitor with a rewards membership card, you may get a discounted popcorn, a free soda, or even a pass to a movie. It's a great deal, but you'll need to invest a bit into the ticket sales before you can get in that perk. Depending on the company, however, many theaters offer free movies to their employees. Some theaters have even been known to offer advanced screenings of new movies for their staff several hours or a day before the films were open to the general public. That's become rare occurrences as online spoilers are becoming more and more common. Yet, strict studio rules won't always keep some sly managers from trying to sneak a peek at the latest installment of a popular franchise. Nowadays, technology allows studios to secure and track their films so they can keep the contents under wraps until the last possible minute on opening day. But pictures with smaller releases or old celluloid prints undergoing a re-release are easier for theaters to present at private screenings, giving early access to employees and their friends and family. The Disney Empire For generations, Disney has made countless dreams come true. But when it comes to their cartoons, movies, and theme parks, they mean business. Even theaters that have been operating smoothly for decades come under the sharp-eyed scrutiny of the house that Mickey built. There are stories of managers who showed Disney trailers one day early, and whether it was accident or not, they were never heard from again. There are tales of Disney representatives coming to cineplexes to train projectionists how to play their movies, change the standard aspect ratio of the screen, installing a custom light into a projector, and acting like they owned the place. Which they did because, didn't you know? Disney owns all. They've run a successful business model through good times and bad, and in order to stay on top, they follow some strict practices. As part of their zero tolerance for bootlegging, they offer $10,000 reward to any theater employees who catch culprits recording in the act. If you smuggled your camcorder into the theater like Kramer from Seinfeld and you get caught, you better wish upon a star because it makes no difference who you are. They'll still send you to the slammer. Frisky Business when couples go into places like this, some PDA is sure to follow. Unfortunately, this is especially true for movie theaters. Theater employees are tasked with breaking up any form of affection that you can imagine. And sometimes, people's intentions can be way too obvious. When the box office guy sees two patrons enter with a blanket, that usually means something's going on. And even if the movie's been out for weeks and is playing to an empty theater, that doesn't mean an employee with a flashlight won't walk in on you like a night cop asking for your license and registration. One British couple learned the consequences to their actions during a screening of that most romantic of love stories, Batman vs. Superman. One of the other six audience members in attendance could obviously see what they were doing as they were seated in the third row. When they ignored a staff member, the police were called and the two moviegoers spent the next 24 hours in jail. If you want to avoid fines or prison bars, save your affections for after the movie. Projection Danger As most major screens around the world have gone digital, it seems like the projectionist's job is getting easier and easier. But it's more than just pressing the play button. Beyond the heavy machinery projecting the movie upon the screen, the most volatile piece of equipment in the entire movie place is a projection bulb. Delicate to the touch and vulnerable to the elements, the tiny light bulb can explode into a thousand minuscule shards of glass without warning. That glass embeds into the skin and itches forever, or at least until you get used to it. These glass pieces are usually too tiny to remove with a tweezer, which is why theaters often require projectionists to take a safety course, as well as wear protective jackets, eyewear, and gloves. Exploding light bulbs are great for any scene with a close-up shot of an old-timey camera taking a picture, or at the ending of a special screening of The Natural when Robert Redford hits a home run into the lights of the stadium. But nobody expects to have glass rain down on them during a showing of Girls Trip. Subliminal Advertising So you've spent 50 bucks on food, had glass rain down on you from above, and there's someone blocking your view from the front row. What keeps you coming back to the theater? Maybe you love the movies or maybe you've been hypnotized by subliminal advertising. 
In 1957, a marketing expert put this idea to the test by splicing split-second images of drink Coca-Cola and eat popcorn into a film. He claimed popcorn sales rose 18% and Coke sales spiked nearly 58%. After some scrutiny, he retracted his research and the outcry over the idea of hidden messages was so fierce, subliminal advertising was banned in the UK. While scientists have found that quick hidden messages can actually be detected by the brain, theaters instead resort to heavily suggested commercials before the movie. Other companies pay for blatant product placements to be inserted into the movie, like in Man of Steel when Superman fights Zod inside a crowded IHOP. But even if advertising was being played at you subliminally, you wouldn't even know it, would you? In a billion dollar industry where everyone's battling for the last buck, the audience is usually at the bottom of the totem pole. But now you've been let in on these 10 secrets movie theaters don't want you to know. You can go spend a night at the cinemas knowing every deep, dark, hidden detail. The Hub has taken you to the skies many times with our videos focused on airplanes. Today, we're going to tell you a little bit about what goes on from the second you arrive at the airport. Checking in, getting through security, and making it to your gate can be a challenge even for experienced travelers. We'll help you be just a bit more aware of what's going on around you the next time you travel. Just like you use the airport kiosk to check in so that you can avoid interacting with humans, go ahead and press the subscribe button to spend more time watching The Hub. Pet safety. Depending on your feelings involving animals, it can brighten your day to see a cat or dog on board your flight. Airlines claim to be able to transport your beloved pet to your destination with you, but this may not be the safest way possible for either your pet or your fellow travelers. Many animals have gotten loose at airports through either the negligence of their owners or airport employees. One case that made headlines was the tragic tale of Jack the Norwegian Forest Cat, who got loose at JFK Airport when a clerk piled his kennel on top of another and then knocked it to the ground. The search for Jack went on for two months until he was finally found, but sadly, he didn't survive the ordeal. One member of airport security claims that cats are way more of an issue than dogs. While a dog is likely to wait around for treats and pats, a loose cat will likely scratch, bite, and try to run and hide. Not to mention that a wayward animal that hasn't been through security is technically a security breach, and that can cause the entire terminal to screech to a halt. Job security. When you're feeling grumpy during your early morning trek to the airport and you want to snap at the person who cheerfully reminds you to take your laptop out of your bag, please resist. It turns out that many TSA employees are even more stressed out than you are. They report high levels of stress and extremely low levels of morale, which leads to an incredibly high turnover rate. Especially during the busy summer months, they can endure mandatory overtime and missing meal and rest breaks. One thing that contributes to this is the number of part-time employees because of a cat put on hiring full-time ones. They're also not protected by the same agencies and rules that look out for other federal workers, such as the Federal Labor Standards Act. Thus, they don't have the same rights and protections against discrimination, making their jobs even harder. Meanwhile, their jobs are stressful enough even without all that. They do a lot more than stare at monitors all day. They go through active shooter training, and in some places are advised not to wear their uniforms to or from work due to threats against the airport. Chit chat. Have you ever noticed that many security officers seem incredibly friendly despite all the stress they're under? This is because they've taken part in a program known as SPOT, or screening of passengers by observation techniques. Scanners and pat-downs are helpful tools, but they're not the only ones security officers have in their arsenal. SPOT was developed by psychology professor Paul Eichmann and it teaches them to look at 94 different signs of anxiety or fear, including lack of eye contact or profuse sweating. Another method involves security personnel simply speaking to passengers in a friendly way and asking plenty of open-ended questions. This method is known as Controlled Cognitive Engagement, or CCE, and is even more effective than SPOT. When done right, it seems like a totally normal conversation, but it's 66% accurate at identifying people who are using deceptive behaviors. If you've ever wondered what officers scribble on your ticket, it may be nothing more than their badge number and initials to let the gate agent know you went through security. But it could also include a symbol that would prompt a more thorough inspection if they do notice something suspicious about you. Directions. Although airport staff may smile politely when you ask for directions, they really do everything possible to stop you from having to ask in the first place. 
time spent explaining how to get from point A to point B is generally frustrating for everyone, so airports are designed to be as easy to navigate as possible. One important aspect is making the tarmac visible when you clear security. This helps you orientate yourself and be aware of the general direction you should head in. Conveniently, airports generally make sure that their shops face the tarmac in order to lure you inside. Those large airport windows let in a lot of light and make the shops seem even more inviting, causing people to wander inside. If you've ever noticed large pieces of artwork in an airport, this isn't just for your viewing pleasure. They provide excellent points of reference since it's easy to tell a fellow traveler to meet you at the large sculpture. This helps herd people to different areas of the airport since people will naturally congregate there. Art also helps give the airport a less sterile appearance, making people feel at ease, which in turn means that they might end up spending more in the shops. Spending. In addition to the artwork making you feel at home in the airport, there are many other subtle ways that airports encourage you to spend more time and money in certain areas. When you check in and get through security, you'll likely notice that the floors are linoleum. However, once you get to the waiting area, they're usually covered in carpet. This makes you feel more at home by giving you a cozy feeling like you might get in your own house. Studies show that relaxed travelers spend 7% more on retail purchases and 10% more in duty-free shops than stressed out travelers do. If you've ever noticed an abundance of massage stands or spas at airports, this is why. We all know that getting through security can be a hassle, and airport employees know that the hour after you make it through is the golden hour. For the next 60 minutes, people feel especially indulgent, so this might explain the reason you feel the need to treat yourself. Those convenient display boards that tell you when to board, they're really just letting you know that you have plenty of time to shop before heading to your gate. Motivation. Modern airports have lots of things that make the tech and travel savvy able to breeze through and get on their planes without a hitch. But whose benefit are those really for? The golden hour is great and all, but they know that the more time you spend at the airport, the more money you spend. After the golden hour, the average customer spends $7 purchasing things at the airport. Since you can't shop before you check in and go through security, they want to make these things as quick as possible. It may seem like the TSA employees are being slow on purpose, but actually they want you to get through as fast as possible so you can start shopping. Those conveniently automated kiosks are 25% faster than humans, so you can print out your own boarding pass and baggage tags and keep right on moving. Travelers being frustrated with a long security line is bad for business. For every 10 minutes a customer spends waiting in line, they're gonna spend 30% less on retail items once they finally get through. It turns out the guy in front of you spending way too long taking his shoes off is actually saving you money by making you wait. Complaints. Oh, we don't mean the complaints that you have about having to get through security and deal with airlines. We're talking about the complaints security employees have about you. Generally, the evening flight passengers tend to be the most easygoing because they're too exhausted to complain, whereas people traveling in the early morning are more on the cranky side of things. They also hate it when you ask them to change their latex gloves that they use to pat you down with. TSA employees actually change their gloves really frequently, even if you didn't see them do it. Rather than argue they'll change their gloves begrudgingly, yet again to keep the line moving. If you opt out of the standard screening and insist on a private pat down, just know that you're annoying all the TSA employees. This slows the line down massively. And as we've said, they want you to get through security as fast as possible. They'd also rather you wait to finish your fancy updo until after you get through security. Piles of elaborate braids and bobby pins may look beautiful, but they require additional inspection to make sure nothing nefarious is lurking underneath your curls. Tips. So the TSA agents sit idly by while you're herded into various shops where you accidentally spend all your hard-earned money on neck pillows and Toblerones. Well, they do know some things that might help you out on your next trip. For instance, forgetting your ID is not necessarily the end of the world. You can still travel without it if they can verify your identity. Sure, you'll have to go through additional screening, but it's way better than missing your flight. Of course, we recommend you bring your ID, but just in case you forget, it's useful to know you don't have to automatically turn the car around. There are also apps such as MyTSA and What's Busy that can let you know how long the security line will be ahead of time. While you're using the free airport Wi-Fi, be sure to follow the TSA Instagram page to stay up to date with all the weird and wacky things people have tried to bring through TSA, which include fireworks, propane cylinders, and even lobsters. Although we can debate on whether they're really liquids or gels, you should also know that you can't bring things like salsa or jelly through security. 
hidden security. You might think that when you slip your shoes back on, you're totally done with the hassle of security. But there are a number of ways in which you're still being monitored even after you make your way to the gate. If you're fortunate, and we assume not try to smuggle illegal drugs or anything, you might have noticed that the airports use dogs that are trained to sniff out any drugs or explosives that might have been snuck through security. These dogs are easy to notice, but less noticeable are the federal air marshals. Although there are less of them than there used to be, they are still thousands making their way through the airport and onto the plane totally incognito, just in case there's a problem. In addition to being trained to fly planes, many pilots are also trained by the TSA and thus may be armed or trained in self-defense, just in case there's an emergency while you're in the air. You can also be searched at any time, and not just during the initial security pat-down. Security agents also trade places with one another about every 30 minutes, just to keep them all alert by making them constantly switch up their tasks. Everyday Threats At the end of the day, TSA agents are humans who are doing the best that they can and are trained to take any threats to safety seriously. We may think of things like knives, guns, and throwing stars to be obvious no-nos, but there are everyday items that tend to get confused with dangerous ones. For instance, many food items can look like explosives when x-rayed, including blocks of cheese or hunks of meat that may look like C4 when viewed in this manner. Also, TSA employees do absolutely assume your gender, and they enter whether you're a male or female before you're scanned. If they guess wrong, your body parts can cause a security delay, as you then have to be patted down in order to confirm that you're not carrying anything dangerous. Sure, bringing your own coffee beans to get around the three ounce liquid rule is clever, but it's also a huge red flag for security. Coffee is often used to mask the scent of illegal drugs, so your bag of beans could mean that you end up getting searched. Bringing a lot of cash to avoid foreign ATM fees is a good idea in theory, but that fat wad of cash also makes you look suspicious and you may end up having to deal with extra searches or questioning. Hopefully, learning more about how airports work will make you a safer and happier traveler. Skip packing the salsa, but bring your own snacks to save money, no matter how quickly you breathe through security. Before you leave, be sure to check out some more great videos from The Hub. Bye for now. Everyone loves going on vacation, but sometimes planning it can be a task and a half. It seems like travel agents know all of the ins and outs of getting you where you want to go, but they also know a lot of things they won't share with you. We'll explore some of the biggest secrets that travel agents don't want you to know before you book your next big trip. Sign up for the latest from the hub by hitting the subscribe button before we begin our journey. Consolidator. The first step in planning a trip is usually booking your plane ticket, but it can be hard to know where to start. What website do you use to search for the best price? When is the ideal time to buy a ticket? Using a travel agent might save you some search time, but you probably could have found a lower fare on your own. Your agent likely purchased your ticket from a consolidator who purchased the tickets directly from the airline at a lower price than most published fares. They then sell the tickets to the travel agent or consumers at a markup. If you're buying from an agent and not a consolidator directly, you're essentially paying two markups instead of one. In addition, you're likely ineligible for any sort of frequent flyer miles or credit card points if you purchase one of these tickets. Depending on your credit card, you could end up with a better deal after points and credits if you purchase the ticket entirely on your own. This will mean less commission for your travel agent, but could mean big savings for you. Shopping smart. Let's say you do decide to buy your own tickets. Where do you start? It turns out there is a best day of the week to do your airfare shopping, and that's Wednesday. Smaller airlines tend to set their prices first, and then larger airlines follow suit and tend to be the ones that raise them even higher. This bidding generally starts on Friday, followed by prices raising on Saturday. Over the weekend, airline companies tend to duke it out by raising and lowering their prices, and Wednesday is when the dust settles, specifically 1 a.m. on Wednesday, because midnight is when the airlines reload their computer systems for the latest low-cost fares. You can also save a few bucks by searching for two one-way tickets instead of round trip. Sometimes by flying two different airlines, you can get the best possible price for the trip yourself. There are even websites such as Kayak and Skyscanner that will automatically do that for you. But be careful if you're buying multiple tickets on the same flight. Some websites show group tickets at a higher rate, so try searching for them individually. Cruises. Your travel agent might promote a cruise as a stress-free way to relax and take in many scenic destinations, but they leave out the part about cruises being really bad for the environment. If you consider yourself an eco-savvy traveler, you definitely don't want to book passage on one of those luxury ships. Well, you're enjoying the all-you-can-eat buffet, bilge water is collecting underneath the ship. This noxious substance is filled with oil and other hazardous chemicals, 
and there have been many cases of ships not disposing of it properly. Not to mention the chemicals flying out of the smokestacks. These include sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, which you may recognize as the primary components of acid rain. Having all of those people on board the ship generates an average of 21,000 gallons of sewage per day. That doesn't include the 170,000 gallons of gray water, which is water that's tainted with detergent, oil, grease, and more that comes from your sink, showers, and laundry machines. There are complicated laws about where this can all be dumped, but international water complicates things, and all that sewage can end up in the ocean completely untreated. Markups. Sure, we know that travel agents have to make money, and it's only fair that they get a commission for their services. But some travel agents admit that they make it a game to see how much they can get away with when marking things up. One agent confessed that his office had a contest to see who could sell a ticket worth $89 for the most money. One poor client ended up paying $265 for that ticket after the agent assured him that the flight was nearly packed and this was his last chance to get on it. If you have an emergency and you need to get somewhere fast, agents know that this is their chance to get the big bucks. Flying for a sudden funeral? If your travel agent finds out, they'll jack up the price because they know you're rushed, desperate, and not thinking clearly. Travel agents make about 25% commission off your trip, while online booking websites like Expedia make closer to 5% commission. With that huge difference in margins, it's easy to see how you can save a ton of money just by booking things yourself. Travel insurance. If travel agents tell you that your ticket is non-refundable, that's probably not true. They tell you that in order to protect their commission, but it's really unlikely that they couldn't get you out of a vacation without having to pay some relatively minor fees. Travel agents admit to coming up with outrageous cancellation fees to make sure that you go on your trip, or at least pay for it so they get their cut. Think you might cancel? Investing in travel insurance might be a good idea, but be careful. Agents get paid 40% commission on travel insurance, so you'd better believe they're eager to sell it to you. It's a huge part of their income, and it might not cover you in case of an emergency, so make sure to go over the contract with a fine-tooth comb. It's also possible to ask for a discount on travel insurance if you do find a good plan and want to purchase it. One agent claims that asking for less than a 20% discount on your travel insurance means that you're getting taken advantage of. Loyalty. When it comes to airlines and hotels, some offer loyalty programs that reward you for utilizing their services often. Travel agents, however, don't work that way. If they know you're going to book with them because you do so frequently, they know they can get away with overcharging you for things. Just like how you shop around for everything else, it's always a good idea to shop around when it comes to travel agents. If one got you a good deal one time, that doesn't necessarily mean they can or will do so again. Agents will often lure you in with cheap prices just to get you to contact them. If you've ever seen a holiday deal that seems too good to be true, it probably is. It can involve traveling at inconvenient times, obscenely long layovers, and subpar hotel conditions. But it got you to click on the ad, which means that now they can sell you a much more expensive and profitable package. You might think that going with a seasoned agent would get you a better deal, but many agents suggest going with someone inexperienced. Travel agencies have a high turnover rate, and experienced staff are more comfortable jacking up prices and are confident enough to pull it off. A newer employee will be more likely to be honest and get you a better price. Tours. Besides travel insurance, a huge part of the agent's commission comes from selling you tours and day trips. It's almost always cheaper for you to book them yourself once you arrive at your destination, rather than paying the agent to do so. Having every little detail planned out in advance can seem like a good thing, but this allows for little flexibility. It means you may end up paying a huge amount for excursions you don't end up going on for whatever reason. By paying the tour operator directly, you know you are getting the best possible deal instead of going through the middleman who wants to collect their fee. You might also encounter an agent who asks you to make large payments up front or all of a sudden wants you to pay off your balance. They might blame it on the hotel, airlines, or tour operators, but usually it's because they need their commission check for some reason or they're trying to make their monthly sale goals and are just a little bit short. Pricing. You might think that if you examine the details carefully, a travel agent can't pull one over on you, but you might be surprised. If an agent is looking at two airlines and one offers a higher commission, that's the one they'll try to sell you on, even if it has worse reviews and a more inconvenient itinerary. Travel agents are often able to reserve seats with certain airlines for a few days, which in theory is good because they can lock in a price while you decide if that's what you want to book. The downside is that they can put holes on the cheapest seats under fake names and make it seem like your only option is a more expensive seat. Even if the travel agent shows you the same screen they're looking at, you should know that their booking software allows them to raise and lower prices at will. This allows them to input discounts, but it also gives them the option of artificially inflating the prices to get you to pay more for your trip. Your agent will ask you for your budget to know how much money you're looking to spend to estimate what they can get out of you. Even if you don't give them a number, 
By asking about your previous vacations or offering an assumed budget and gauging a response, they can generally figure it out. Professional. Most people assume that since travel agents book so many trips, they must have resources available to them that the average person doesn't. Sure, they're given access to booking engines for some suppliers, but ultimately you're limited to suppliers that the agency has a relationship with. For example, some low-cost carriers such as AirAsia make such a small profit on seats that they don't pay commission to agents. That means no travel agent is going to recommend those airlines to you because there's no profit in it for them, even if it would mean saving you a bunch of money. Although travel agents like to travel as much as anyone, and they have experience planning trips, they mainly use the same information sources you do. Namely, they just Google it. If you know how to use TripAdvisor, Wikipedia, and Google, you can look things up just like professional travel agents do. Many agents will claim that they've been to wherever you're looking to book, but more often than not, they're just making that up and are giving you information based on other trips they've booked and not ones they've personally taken themselves. Specifics. By now you might be wondering, who on earth is still using travel agents? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2000, there were about 124,000 freelance travel agents in the United States, and in 2014, there were only 64,250. So clearly their numbers are decreasing, but they still do exist. For a certain type of travel, agents do offer a decent value. Basically, if you're the sort of person who has more money than time to spend on a trip, a travel agent makes sense. If you're booking high-end activities and accommodations, especially for large groups, a travel agent can really help you out. Putting together these trips can be complex as they have a lot of variables to consider, and sometimes it's worth the extra cash not to have to worry about it. Some people underestimate just how time-consuming planning a trip can be, and to some people it isn't worth the hassle. If you're planning a simple trip on your own, you can save a ton of money by doing your own research and making your own reservations. During your flight, you may think that your flight attendant is just the person responsible for handing out your complimentary snacks. However, these highly trained specialists have a lot of information that most passengers have no clue about. While you enjoy the in-flight movie, there are tons of things going around you without you even noticing. Let the hub enlighten you. Before takeoff, please make sure you're buckled in and don't turn off your electronic device. Instead, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications. The food. Where would stand-up comedians be without being able to fall back on the classic and relatable bit about the poor quality of airline food? Even if you're lucky enough to be in first class, it's likely that the food you eat in flight just doesn't taste as good as the stuff you eat at home. Well, there's actually a good reason for this, and it may not be entirely the airline's fault. As the plane gains altitude, humidity plummets to less than 12%, making it drier than most deserts. The dryness and the low pressure affects your taste buds in a huge way. This reduces your ability to detect saltiness and sweetness by about 30%. Flavor is more complicated than most of us realize, and your sense of smell plays a huge part in how you perceive flavors. Up to 80% of what we think is taste is actually us smelling our food. In order to get a proper sniff, we need a supply of good old nasal mucus, which unfortunately dries up due to the conditions on the plane, dramatically reducing our ability to smell. This makes food we eat in the air taste twice as bland as if we ate the same food on the ground. Extra passengers. You know that the plane you're riding on is transporting more than human cargo, and the cargo hold is packed full of suitcases. However, there might be a few extra people on your flight, and we're not talking about stowaways. If someone passes away and needs to be transported for burial, it's not like they're gonna send a hearse cross country. Instead, the dearly departed is packed on board an airplane in the cargo hold, right next to your suitcase. If it's not an entire human being, it could well be an organ intended for transplant at a hospital near your destination. But what if someone starts out on their journey as a passenger before passing over? The protocol about that situation varies from plane to plane. Some actually have special cabinets in order to hide bodies, but others do not. It's not a simple matter of dragging someone into the bathroom and making it look occupied either, since the person needs to be buckled down in case of turbulence. One flight attendant admitted that when a gentleman passed away on her flight, she and her coworkers simply covered him with a blanket in the seat as if he was sleeping. They didn't want to cause panic so they played out a real-life Weekend at Bernie situation until the plane landed. Have you ever wished you could see the most amazing video content all in one place? Look no further than the premium. You'll gain access to thousands of ad-free videos from the richest, Screen Rant, The Taco, The Sportster, The Things, and more. It's free to sign up, so log on today. Best of all, you'll get the first peek at the newest content available before anyone else does. What are you waiting for? Check out the premium and start binge-watching now bathrooms. 
One thing you should know about the bathroom doors on a flight is that they don't lock. Oh, sure, they have a mechanism that looks like a lock and sounds like one when you slide it over, causing the light outside to indicate that it's occupied. But for safety reasons, that door isn't really locked for all intents and purposes. It's remarkably easy to unlock a bathroom door from the outside if you're on an airplane, and they're actually designed that way. It's a simple method of sliding the knob into the unlocked position, just like you would inside of the bathroom. Feeling nauseous? If you don't think your complimentary air sickness bag will be enough, make sure you aim for the toilet and not the sink. The sink won't be able to handle it, and flight attendants don't get paid enough to clean up your vomit. They'll end up blocking off the bathroom for the rest of the flight, which is hugely inconvenient for your fellow passengers. And if you must slip off your shoes on the plane, at least put them on for your trip to the bathroom. Those floors are rarely clean, and you can tell yourself that wet spot on the floor is just water from the sink, but we all know it's not. Germs. Anytime you pack a bunch of people into a single area, you're going to get a lot of germs. Flight attendants do their best, but due to time constraints, they aren't able to clean as well as we might like them to between flights. Surprisingly, airplane bathrooms are relatively clean, all things considered. The biggest culprit for germs is the tray table. One test showed that tray tables held over 2,000 colony-forming units per square inch, meaning that the bacterial and fungal cells on there are able to multiply. That's way more than the 265 found on the toilet flushing button or the 230 found on your seatbelt. It might be tempting to plop your in-flight meal on your tray table, but you should probably wipe it down with a sanitizing cloth first. In terms of being surrounded by germs, you're actually better off eating your meal in the bathroom than at your seat. Although, for the record, we don't recommend that. Transmission. If you're wondering how your fellow humans manage to infect every surface on a plane with germs, the answer is simple, skin cells. The average human loses 30,000 to 40,000 skin cells per hour, and on a plane, those cells have nowhere to go. In the United States, about 1 to 2% of the population is carrying MRSA, which can not only be serious, but is also asymptomatic at first, meaning that someone may not even know they're a disease vector when they step onto the plane. Researchers at Auburn University wanted to know how hospitable airline surfaces are for germs, so they infected seats with MRSA and E. coli. MRSA seemed to prefer the seat pocket, and was able to live up to 168 hours nestled in there. The E. coli preferred the rubber armrest, where it thrived for 96 hours. When it comes to transmitting the bacteria, less porous surfaces mean that there's less space for the bacteria to nestle into, increasing the risk of it ending up on you. So even though there's likely more bacteria in the seat pocket, you're more likely to pick it up on a non-porous surface, such as the metal in the bathroom. We weren't kidding about not eating your food in there, even though there are technically less germs. Safety measures. If your eyes tend to gloss over when the flight attendant gives their safety lectures, you should know that safety is something they take very seriously. There are a lot of safety measures in place that you might not even be aware of. The most dangerous times on a plane are during takeoff and landing, and you'll notice that the cabin lights dim during this time. That is because it gives your eyes a chance to adjust to the darkness just in case something goes wrong and you need to hastily exit the plane. Just keep that in mind before you flick on your reading light while the plane is in the middle of taking off. The reason they have you put your tray tables up is so that they don't get in the way of you or anyone else trying to get off the plane quickly. It's also advised that you keep your window shade open so firefighters can spot you in an emergency situation. If you have to leave via one of those fun-looking rubber slides, you'll want to make sure you're wearing pants and long sleeves. Otherwise, your skin might stick to the side of the slide, causing friction burns sleeping. You might enjoy catching up on some shut-eye during a flight, but it turns out the pilot might as well. In a survey conducted by a pilot's union, 56% of pilots admitted to sleeping while flying a plane, and the co-pilot likely wouldn't be very helpful in this situation, since 29% of sleepy pilots claim that when they woke up, they saw their co-pilot still snoozing. Even those pilots who can resist falling asleep aren't immune to having their skills compromised due to exhaustion. 86% of pilots claim that their abilities to perform their job had been compromised at some point in the last six months due to tiredness. When asked the top threat to passenger safety, 49% of pilots claim that it was their own exhaustion. That is three times more than any other threat mentioned on the survey. Pilots can be assigned rest periods during long flights, but this study focused on ones who fell asleep involuntarily while flying, and the numbers are pretty alarming. Pilot safety. 
While some pilots can't help but give in to their exhaustion at times, they actually do a lot of things to keep you safe that you probably don't know about. When the plane is getting ready to take off and you're stowing your carry-on safely underneath the seat in front of you, your pilots are going through their own safety ritual as well. It's known as a touch drill, and it involves going through the motions of various flight procedures. It helps ingrain the process in their muscle memory to avoid giving in to panic during an emergency situation. If your body knows exactly what to do, it can still function even if your brain isn't totally focused on the task at hand because of some distraction. It can help you to do something similar with your seatbelt. In the event of a plane crash, many passengers report losing precious time trying to release their seatbelts the way that they would in their much more familiar cars. Practice buckling and unbuckling yourself a few times when you board. Pilots also eat separate meals from each other, just in case one meal is tainted. That way, at least one pilot will be able to continue the flight safely if one of them contracts food poisoning. Water. When you think about all that bacteria on the water fountain at the airport, you may decide to wait until you're on the plane to grab a drink. But your best bet is to grab a bottle of water instead of opting for some from the tap. Flight attendants reveal that when the plane stops to replenish supplies, the water in the plane is refilled just a few feet away from where the bathroom is being pumped out. And those tasks are occasionally conducted by the same person. During a test of water found on airplanes, 14 different flights were found to have bacteria levels that were 10 or even hundreds of times above that which the US government recommends for safety. And don't bother asking for a cup of ice, since that's made from the same potentially contaminated water. The ice may actually be more tainted, as the scoop and ice cube trays are seldom washed, and flight attendants rarely have time to wash their hands before touching either of those things. First class. If you can afford it, first class gives you some extra leg room, extra time to board, and some premium snacks. There is a rather hidden cost though. Airlines are just banking on you not having to pay it. In the unlikely event of an accident, you're sitting in the most unsafe portion of the plane. To determine where the safest place to be is in case of a crash, scientists purposely crashed a Boeing 747 airplane in what must have been one of the most fun science experiments ever. They found that the seats located in the middle of the cabin and those near the rear seemed to have survived the best. The crash test dummies in those seats had been tossed around and many had broken ankles. Provided that they were able to maneuver by themselves or with assistance and get off the plane before it caught fire, it's likely they would have survived. Those seated in first class, not so much. The cockpit was completely ripped away from the rest of the cabin, and the seats located right behind it were incredibly mangled as a result. One of the seats was even found about 500 feet away from the crash site. Time Magazine also reported that first class passengers have a 10% higher risk of fatality than those seated near the back of the plane. 